Today is June 13th, 2023. I want to talk about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, and I want to talk about the ongoing Ukrainian offensive. They are now well into their second week. I want to start by looking at uh, liveuamap.com. This is a pro-Ukrainian live map, so keep that in mind as we take a look at it. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is the Kherson and Zaporozhia area, and here we see Ukraine claiming to have made gains. But as you can see, these are, are mere dents in the security zone of the front line. They have not even reached anywhere close to the main lines of defense, which are layered and extend all the way to the coast and all the way to Crimea. There are multiple main defensive lines. Ukraine has not even reached the first. They're still in the security zone. And if you zoom in very, very closely, uh, you will see that these are tiny, tiny little villages that they have taken. And these are villages that have ch changed hands several times over the last two weeks. That is where they are right now. And I just want to show you on this, this BBC article, Ukraine offensive, what will it take for military, for military push to succeed? Uh, and you see even their map, this uh, hatched line here, this is the security zone and this is where the fighting is taking place and they show these tiny villages that Ukraine claims to be holding and you can see the whole rest of the territory Ukraine still has to punch through. Now, a lot of these areas along the front have already been evacuated and we can go to articles like this from Reuters, frontline residents evacuated to Russian controlled ports before expected counteroffensive. This was all the way back in May. This was over a month ago. And that is what Russia had done. They had moved everyone back away from the front line. They knew the offensive was going to take place. They knew these frontline villages would be under heavy artillery fire. They knew it would be part of the security zone and it would be targeted by both sides, Russia mounting its mobile defense in the security zone and Ukraine trying to storm through it to reach the first line of Russian defenses. Now going back to the live map, uh, there is also fighting all along the, the front line in the Donbas region. And as I've said in my last update, there could be up to two thirds worth of Ukrainian offensive potential still left. Uh, they are hitting these two areas, as you can see. They may bank on Russian reserves being sent to these areas, and they may feel that yet another area, including even in the Donbas, is now under defended and they might try to launch an offensive in that direction as well. We just have to wait and see. How's the Western media covering the offensive now that we're into the second week? What are they saying about the offensive? Let's start with this article from CNN. Ukraine loses 16 US made armored vehicles group says, but Kiev's forces still gain territory. When they say gain territory, they're talking about this handful of villages that they are holding at the moment in the security zone. What does CNN say? They say Ukraine has lost 16 US supplied armored vehicles in the past several days, according to open source intelligence analysis. As the country's military announced its forces had captured three villages from Russia and an offensive in the eastern Donetsk region. The 16 U.S. Bradley Infantry fighting vehicles either destroyed or damaged and abandoned in recent days represent almost 15% of the 109 that Washington has given Kiev, according to uh, this open source intelligence website, Oryx, uh, which has been collecting visual evidence of military equipment losses in Ukraine since Russia's invasion began in February 24, 2022. Well, Oryx is a war propaganda outfit. They spread war propaganda. And one of the things that they are very quick to say when talking about Russian losses is that this is only the visual evidence that they have. If this is how much visual evidence they have, 16 lost Bradleys, then surely there are many, many more uh, that they don't have visual evidence of, but have also been destroyed. Now, 16, that's more than a company's worth of these armored vehicles. Uh, 
15%. It's probably more than 15%. They're talking about pictures. Uh, let's go back to the article. They're talking about pictures like this, which I went over in my last update. These are Bradleys. This is a Bradley. That is a Bradley. And these were all in a field with many more around them. They were disabled or destroyed from mines and then uh, follow up attacks from Russian forces on the disabled vehicles to make sure they're not recovered. I have seen many, many more videos other than that. I have seen video footage of Bradley's being destroyed by KA-52 attack helicopters, several by different types of drones. Uh, these FPV, first person view drones and Lancet drones, essentially su suicide drones, kamikaze drones, uh, also anti-tank guided missiles, and even a Bradley destroyed by a Russian tank at about 1,300 meters away. And uh, in that footage, you can see the infrared sights that the Russian tank has. And Ukraine was attempting to storm a lot of uh, Russian positions at nighttime, hoping that Russia simply didn't have night vision, which is something the US did during its invasions of Iraq, both Desert Storm and the 2003 invasion. Iraq did not have night vision, and they were able to destroy huge quantities of tanks without suffering any losses at all because they had night vision, they had infrared, and the Iraqis didn't. Well, Russia has infrared, so that, that's not going to work this time. Clearly, it's not working this time. CNN admits, when Washington announced in January it would supply Bradleys to Ukraine, CNN military analyst James Spider Martz, a retired general, said the Bradleys would need the right mix of other abilities, including air support, long-range artillery, and incisive intelligence. A single piece of equipment like the Bradleys is wonderful, but it needs to be used in conjunction with all of these other enablers, he said at the time. And of course, Ukraine doesn't have any of these enablers. They have no air cover. They don't even have air defense at this point. Their long-range artillery is minimal. They've lost huge quantities of the actual artillery pieces, both towed and self-propelled. They also have a severe artillery shell shortage that cannot be rectified, cannot be rectified, and they cannot compare to the firepower Russia has available to it. And this is exactly why Ukraine is forced to organize its offensive in this manner in the first place. They have to storm across open territory, close into Russian positions, and hope that there's enough of their force left as they close in to inflict enough losses on Russian forces to compel them to leave. And the thing is that it, it does work. It does uh, compel Russian forces to withdraw. But as they're withdrawing, they continue inflicting losses on Ukrainian forces. Plus, uh, long range weaponry continues inflicting losses on Ukrainian forces. Those Ukrainian forces then must withdraw before they're fully destroyed. And when they do, the mobile defenses of uh, the Russian forces filled the void that they left, that territory that they temporarily took. And that is what's been going on the last two weeks now. Here's another article from Forbes. The Ukrainian army has already lost half of its unique Leopard 2R breaching vehicles. And they show this image, and this, this image is from a series of images, by the way. Uh, here, uh, Scott from Calibrated, I'll put the, the links to his Twitter and his YouTube channel in the video description below. Uh, you can see in this series of images, there's also Leopard 2 main battle tanks, uh, Bradleys, and then uh, as you go through the images, you see different types of breaching equipment, including these Leopard 2R vehicles. There's, I think, only six of them, three of them been, have been destroyed and are burning in this very picture here. Uh, and then just more destroyed equipment. And you see these pathways that they're trying to clear through the minefield. Uh, this is how they're trying to breach the security zone of Russian defenses, not even the first defense lot. Here's what Forbes says, that engineers lost so many vehicles on or around Thursday doesn't mean the assault on Russian positions has failed yet. A frontal attack on enemy fortifications, a breach is among the most difficult and potentially costliest operations in ground warfare. Even the best equipped, best trained armies expect to lose as much as half of the assault force during a successful breach. As it happens, the Ukrainian 47th Assault Brigade is just a week, in just a week of hard fighting, has abandoned three of its 
six best breaching vehicles. It's Finnish made Leopard 2Rs. Other confirmed Ukrainian losses include a Soviet style IMR2 engineering vehicle and an ex German Bergpanzer, but uh, also Leopard 2 main battle tanks, Bradleys, and I think I saw some Max Pro M MRAPs in there as well. They have lost half just trying to breach the security zone. Again, they have not even reached the first defensive line and there are multiple defensive lines. Uh, in my previous update, I went over the New York Times article from last December, last year. Uh, they have spent over six months, the Russians, building layered defenses from where the fighting is taking place right now, all the way to the coast and all the way to Crimea. So if, you're, if you've already lost half of, uh, they, they talk about three brigades, uh, they have six brigades left. Who thinks that this is sustainable, that they're going to reach the coast? And, and even if they've reached the coast, what are they going to do then? What are they going to use to hold that from a Russian counteroffensive? The whole reason they're making any progress at all is because Russian forces withdraw to avoid losing uh, heavy casualties and losing large amounts of equipment. They, they fall back to avoid that. If they fall back all the way to the coast, it's because they want to preserve their fighting capacity while wearing down Ukrainian forces. We see the Ukrainian forces clearly taking much heavier losses, as is expected during an offensive. This is what Forbes says about the total number of uh, brigades that Ukraine has for this offensive. Ukraine stood up nine new brigades with American and European equipment and assigned all of them to the 2023 counteroffensive. So far, just three. 33rd Mechanized Brigade, 47th Assault Brigade, and 37th Marine Brigade have joined the fight. The six other new brigades, including units with ex-Polish PT-91 tanks, which is like a T-72 variant, ex-British Challenger 2 tanks, which they, they have a very small number of, and they are no more capable than these Leopard 2s that are burning in heaps on the battlefield right now. And ex-American Striker infantry fighting vehicles. These Strikers are even le more lightly armored than the Bradley, less survivable, and because they're wheeled, will have other unique problems that a tracked vehicle will not have, trying to cross some of these obstacles and just the terrain itself. Apparently are waiting for the lead brigades to open gaps in Russian lines, at which point they'll attack and exploit the gaps, which, okay, great. You breach the security zone, you've got this gap, you exploit it, then these six of nine brigades are going to run into the first several defensive lines, and the exact same thing is going to happen to them. This is how Russia has been waging this entire conflict. Uh, this is why Ukraine is running out of equipment and manpower and ammunition. This is why Russia isn't. They have a greater military industrial output than Ukraine and its Western sponsors. They're also conserving their manpower and equipment uh, by deliberately choosing to go on the offensive through these slow incremental grinding operations and also falling back when in the defense, these, these layered defenses. Uh, this is what distinguishes Russian tactics and strategy from Ukrainian tactics and strategy. We, we've seen Ukrainian defensive strategies in Bakhmut. It's a stand and fight order. They just stand there and they fight until they're all, they're all dead and they literally cannot stay there any longer. Whoever remains has to fall back. That's how they do their defense. Unsustainable in a war of attrition. And this war of attrition, this idea of a war of attrition, this is even mentioned in this BBC article. Uh, this is the one that I referenced earlier in the video. Ukrainian Ukraine offensive, what will it take for military push to succeed? Uh, further down in the article, it says, Russia as the vastly bigger country can draw on more resources than Ukraine. And, and surely the people at the BBC realize that it's not just Ukraine, it's also Ukraine's Western sponsors. President Vladimir Putin, who started this war in the first place, uh, knows that if he can only wear down the Ukrainians into a stalemate that drags on into next year, then there is a chance that the US and other allies will tire of supporting this expensive war effort and start to pressure Kiev to reach a ceasefire compromise. That's not even a matter of expense. The West doesn't care about how expensive it is. The real problem is they are literally running out of weapons and ammunition to give to Ukraine to continue this conflict. Speaking of giving Ukraine more weapons, uh, as I normally do when the 
Department of Defense announces a new security assistance package for Ukraine. I go over it item by item. It just so happens that Voice of America here, which is US uh, government funded media, they went over the upcoming package. So it has not been posted on the Department of Defense website yet, but they go over it here in this article, US providing 325 million more in aid for Ukraine. And the article says, the package is expected to include Stryker and Bradley armored vehicles that can replace those damaged and destroyed in the Ukrainian counteroffensive currently underway, according to two defense officials who spoke to VOA on the condition of anonymity ahead of the package's expected release Tuesday. I'm recording this on Tuesday, but I'm plus seven GMT, so it's probably going to be on the Department of Defense's website either by the end of today or tomorrow sometime tomorrow it also says the official said the latest aid also includes munitions for national advanced surface air missile systems nasums along with more rockets for ukraine's high mobility artillery rocket systems HIMARS. it also says the aid announced comes amid reports that ukraine has lost more than a dozen bradley infantry fighting vehicles in recent days i think many more than uh more than a dozen probably uh, we're talking a score or more at this point uh, highlighting the military costs of the current counteroffensive. And that's not a good sign. You have to arrange these type of packages in the middle of a counteroffensive because the Ukrainians are losing so many vehicles. And it's hard to understand why they're doing it this way. Why, if they anticipated heavy losses and they should have anticipated heavy losses, why didn't they just give them more Bradleys to begin with? Is this a reflection of the reality that Russia is successfully, effectively hitting staging points all across Ukraine and destroying this equipment before it even reaches the battlefield. Is that a possibility? And they're just keeping it, say, in Poland and releasing it in small batches to minimize the, the possibility of it being found and destroyed all at once before it even gets to the front line. I don't know. It just doesn't seem good that you're in the middle of the offensive and you, you admittedly have to send more vehicles because so many are being destroyed. The article admits a senior military official speaking to Voice of America on the condition of anonymity to discuss security matters said the Ukrainian counteroffensive would probably not be as dramatic as some people expect, but still would be carried out deliberately and effectively by targeting Russia's ability to control its defenses in Ukraine, whatever that means. Russian forces have spent months heavily fortifying their positions inside Ukraine, making Kiev's counteroffensive even more difficult to execute. It's harder to go on the offensive than it is to be on the defensive. This is a well-known fact. Ukrainians have, entr Ukrainians have entrenched dug in Russian forces with minefields in front of them. That's about as hard as it gets in warfare. And it's not just one line of Russians with minefields ahead of them. It is, again, it is multiple, multiple layers of defenses. I just want to show people once again, this New York Times article from December 2022, defenses carved into the earth and they show, you can see the lines of defenses here. And this is this would be considered one defensive line. And they have multiple lines like this going across the map. And they, they even illustrate this. They show the areas where the defenses were built. So this is exactly where Ukraine's offensive is taking place right now. Uh, they show the types of defenses. Uh, and Ukraine hasn't even reached any of these yet. The, the anti-vehicle trench, the dragon's teeth, the pillboxes, they have not even reached these yet. And then they show the uh, positions, at least the ones that they could see as of December 2022. This is in the Donbas region. This is Bakhmut. Uh, Russian forces have completely taken the city of Bakhmut. If Ukraine were to take Bakhmut and attempt to push into the Donbas region, look at how many defensive positions they would have to cross to do so. Uh, same goes for the Zaporozhia. Kherson, Crimea region. Look at how many uh, kilometers. And that's just from Miletopol. That's how many kilometers of defenses Ukraine would have to cross in order to reach Crimea. It's about 100 to 200 kilometers worth of defenses they will have to cross depending on what their objective is. So I just, I just think it's so important to keep po pointing this out. It's hard for anyone to concentrate thousands or even tens of thousands of troops in just a few areas along the line of contact and not make some sort of progress. Ukraine will make some sort of progress. They could even make a lot of progress. 
Uh, in previous videos, I've even suggested the possibility of them taking back Bakhmut and running into those defense lines outside of Pafisnaya. And I've also talked about the possibility of Ukrainian forces even reaching all the way to the coast. The problem is, considering the losses that they are suffering, when they finally reach their objectives, what are they going to have left to hold them? Because that's the other part of a successful offensive, is consolidating your gains. Is Ukraine able to do that? I think the answer is no. And I think if they do reach any of these objectives, it'll only be because Russian forces make the decision to withdraw. And as they do, they will continue grinding Ukrainian forces down. And wherever the Ukrainian offensive ends on the map, Russian forces will have preserved themselves uh, much more so than Ukrainian forces, and they will have the advantage once again. This is exactly what happened at the end of the fall offensives Ukraine executed last year. This is what happened. They lost an entire army's worth of men and equipment, and they were left very vulnerable on the battlefield for almost an entire year before launching this new offensive. They were spending that entire time rebuilding their army for this offensive. What about after? So that we're, we're in the second week of the offensive. The offensive will continue um, depending on how much ammunition and equipment and trained manpower Ukraine still has on hand, considering the extensive missile and drone campaign carried out by Russia before that to disrupt their preparations, they could have uh, a month or more worth of offensive potential to continue fighting. But what happens after the offensive? What, what do they do after the offensive? There's a very good video by the Duran. I'm going to put a link to this in the video description below and they're talking about after the offensive we already hear talks amongst the most extreme voices across the west about deploying nato troops into ukraine to continue the fighting after ukraine exhausts uh, their combat potential and even the prospect of sending nuclear weapons to ukraine i'm not even kidding and when i heard that i thought it was very difficult to believe but i tracked down the article that they referenced in their video. Uh, this is AEI. This is one of these corporate financier funded think tanks that, that direct US foreign and domestic policy. Can Biden deter a Russian nuclear attack on Ukraine? Yes, if he gives Ukraine tactical nukes. This is by Michael Rubin, senior fellow. And Russia doesn't need to use nuclear weapons. They're, they're clearly capable of destroying Ukraine's military incrementally methodically, systematically, without not without the need of escalating this to, into nuclear weapons. It's the West that is desperate. When you hear the West talking about deploying NATO troops into Ukraine, talking about giving Ukraine nuclear weapons, that is because they are desperate. That does not sound like someone who is winning. That does not sound like someone who is confident about the way this conflict is going. And if you look at his other, his other recent op-eds, like this, Russia is defaulting on weapon sales. The U.S. should fill the gap. Fill the gap with what? They're also defaulting. They also don't have enough weapons for their allies and also to supply Ukraine. So this is this is a senior fellow at a very large, well-funded think tank who is writing pieces that are frankly delusional. Uh, let's see some others. Uh, designate Belarus a state sponsor of terrorism. Preparing for Vladimir Putin's war crimes trial. Ukraine must be allowed to hit inside Russia to stop a possible new offensive. That was in January 2023. U Ukraine has been attempting to strike targets inside of Russia. But the idea that you're going to stop or disrupt Russian military potential by striking inside the vast nation of Russia just illustrates how little these people actually understand of modern warfare. And they are the ones attempting to dictate policy that shapes modern warfare. So please check out that recent video by the Duran. Uh, I, of course, will continue keeping an eye on the offensive as it unfolds. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, check the video description for other places you can find and follow my work. I am on Telegram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my videos are all backed up on Rumble and Odyssey in case YouTube deletes my channel. Uh, check the video description 
uh, for all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. If an ad pops up, feel free to skip it. It does me no good. If you do wanna support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee or through Patreon. Uh, whether you're giving uh, one-time donations or month-to-month -month donations, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, it's all greatly appreciated. It is what makes this work possible, so thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.